Gregory, welcome to Art and Cocktails. I'm so excited to chat with you. I'm a huge fan of your work, and it's been such an honor to have you in our latest issue. So welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. And thanks for having me on the podcast. Yes, I'm super excited. I have many questions for you about your beautiful work and process. And I also saw recently that you are like creating beautiful landscape stuff in your own world, in your own home. Can you talk a little bit about what inspires you? What drives your work? I know it has to do with nature and, you know, all the beautiful (laughs) processes that you share. If you could just tell us a little bit about your work and yourself. Sure. Um, I think as a kid growing up in a rural landscape, my father uh, would take me for walks and kind of make me aware of things that maybe uh, only adults would be aware of, you know, like textures of bark. And I mean, kids naturally are inquisitive, and but they kind of need guidance sometimes. Otherwise, they're like off fooling around and, you know, like playing games, um, which can be great you know you can learn that way but like a lot of times you don't know what you don't know and so he would walk and be like notice the pattern on this bark and like notice oh and then he'd like we'd be walking and he'd hold his hand up and he'd be like you know that would mean like be quiet and listen because he heard something that's interesting and so like just those kind of moments as a a young kid I think were important and then also my mom was a landscape architect so she went back to school later in life. She was going to school to be a nurse and then she had two kids and then, you know, became the stay at home mom and worked jobs uh, to support the family and so on. But then after we were kind of done, she went back to school and became a landscape architect and was like, you know, learning all the Latin names of plants and stuff like that. And so that was really cool to see her do those drawings and see that, you know, uh, you could design a space, which I knew full well, because like my parents both had been doing that from day one, like making these beautiful gardens and stuff. So we always grew up in this lush space but I think so many artists talk about like where they grew up or the things that happened when they grew up as the inspiration for you know like why they're into what they're into and I would say it's really no different for me and as far as like now owning a property I have a a barn and like seven eight acres of land and it's forested because the farm kind of like uh you know sunsetted and now I'm using the barn as my studio. I rebuilt it and like kind of, uh, you know, put a furnace out there, insulated it and so on. Um, but now that I'm here, again, the connection to the land is so strong that uh, most of my work, all the little diorama stuff that you see in the work, all that stuff is pulled from the land. So people are like, oh, he just goes to the store and buys it. Like, no, I, I dry it all. I spray it with PVA glue. I sprinkle it with moss to get the green stuff. And, you know, like all of that is like from the land. But the other thing is, is when you live in a space like this, it's hard not to want to create like actually in the space. So I'm um, like designing areas all over the place, you know, like building forts and making walls and, you know, like I'll take all the trees that aren't supposed to be growing here and cut them down and weave them through a, an area and make like a, you know, a, a wall. Like, I'm, I'm not sure if you can actually see, but like over there by the oh, barn, so cool. there's like a wall around my food garden. So I have two children as well. And part of the reason why I love to, they're young. And part of the reason why I love to do all this stuff is I want to show them, you know, kind of the way my dad showed me and mom showed me, but like, I want to show them that like the world is interesting enough. Like you don't need all this plastic garbage to play with. Like, you know, you just go out in the prairie and grab these things and look at them. Like they're so intricate and interesting, you know, like there's enough inspiration all around you. And Uh so I started doing a lot of land projects, you know, and that kind of bites into the time of, making art but it's equally as rewarding it takes a little bit more recovery when you're 50 too because if you're (laughs) digging post holes all day like it's a lot of it's a lot of leave yeah well I think it it might keep you young actually you know being active like that that's a (laughs) that's a really great um I, I have so many questions so thank you so much for sharing your background and I can totally see how you know your upbringing definitely influences your work now and would you say that working on the land and building these projects is that part of your practice or is that more of a personal exploration you know i was just listening to the talking heads this morning and uh there's a line 
in this song. Uh, it says, uh, never for money, always for love. Mm. Uh, and that just struck a chord with me because, damn it, like this society we live in with like everything being online, I, I can see the benefits of it. But then it also just feels like we're being manipulated through these algorithms and like, you know, like what type of artwork gets shown and who gets attention and stuff like that. All of that has come to my uh, attention. And like, I would love to just work in the land and just like garden and do things. You know, many artists have done it. I would not be the mm -hmm. first where it's like they reach a certain level of success and they're like, you know what? The game, the rat race, the whatever is just like not as enjoyable as I thought it was going to be. I'd rather be an organic farmer, <laughs> like that type of thing. <laughs> uh, um, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. I do want to talk about that in the moment, but I want to go back a little bit because I do want to talk about the, you know, the thing that inevitably we all have to deal with, <laughs> which is, to, you know, supporting ourselves. It, it's, and it is important, but you're right. And like, just going back to what you're mentioning about showing your kids and uh, passing it on to them. Some of my biggest core memories are like playing with the dandelion or, you know, my friend's grandpa building us like a little tent out of fern branches and sticks yeah. in the woods and us <laughs> boiling a soup. Like I grew up in Russia. So it was like, you know, <laughs> very post-Soviet. Um, but it, it's so interesting because I don't rem like, I obviously I remember being so excited to get like my Barbie, the plastic that we're talking about, but the things that really I romanticize are just like biking around playing with sticks. And, and I think that's so beautiful as you were growing up and finding your voice as an artist, what are your first like, um, interactions with art materials? What did that look like? Did you start by using things out of nature right away? Or was it something that came in later? Like, what was your first expression? Like, if you don't mind going back there? Sure. Um, for me, I think my father was an art teacher, but it was never like, you know, like Tiger Woods or something like that, where he was like, you know, let's go draw, you know, <laughs> like faster, faster. No, it was never like, even encouraged necessarily let's just say it wasn't discouraged which was great because I myself became an art teacher and I had parents come in for student teacher conferences and the parents are like he's not an artist you know and you're like whoa <laughs> like, how let's ask him first you know like that kind of thing um so there's this real negative stigma out there about becoming an artist and I've learned that through teaching and interacting with parents like they all think that they're going to end up living in the basement eating ramen um, but, you know, f for me, that experience uh, was my dad giving me supplies. So for Christmas or for my birthday or whatever, he'd bring the catalog home and say, like, is there anything you want from the catalog? I can order it. And that was, you know, encouraging because I always had paper. I always had charcoal. But like, really, the, the first memory I have of like, experiencing nature or like you know using nature in my work was when I got a camera and started shooting photographs because I was just fascinated with black and white photography and how you know I could go out and take these pictures and then have them back in my bedroom like I had like a little easel type thing like a little art desk in the corner of my room um, and I would just go in there and draw these pictures then so I was drawing from life but initially the inspiration was like trying to catch a uh, interesting photograph of oak bark you know, or like a riverbed or something like that. So photography was probably my first love. And then I used those photographs to do drawing because uh, I think as a kid, art was pitched to me, I think as many people as like drawing, painting, sculpture, like photography wasn't really like, you know, a thing where in 1978 or whatever the heck it was, uh, where, you know, we didn't think about photography as art. And um so those are some of my first memories of like traveling to places specifically to take photographs as a young kid. Like I asked to go to Milwaukee to shoot photographs of buildings so I could draw them. Mm. Um, and so uh, drawing kind of came secondary to that. But of course, that's what I thought was the art, you know, so mostly just doing pencil drawings. I think, you know, just starting off doing realistic pencil drawings and then later on in high school when I started finding out that like it's possible to manipulate reality like surrealists or things like that then I started becoming interested in like the why like why are you just drawing a picture of tree bark like what are you saying with that and that's where uh 
kind of like I was stuck for a long time through college. You know, I didn't really, as a young kid, I kind of latched on to things and then those were my things. Mm. And I didn't really expand out from that. Well, once I got out of college, then I realized I got this like super thick book on, it was just essays from artists and it was a collection or two volumes of it. And I just read those like nonstop. And like every artist had their manifesto or the reason why another art movement, the ism was like wrong. And I, I became fascinated with these ideas and how the ideas dictate the image. And then for me, it was like, I'm a landscape painter why am I doing these things that are kind of just realistic like I should be bringing the land into my work in some way or another and then in grad school I realized like wouldn't it be cool if the work became the land like had mm -hmm. topography in it and like actually had like a uh, parallax like you can move around it um, and that just became more like quote unquote honest to me if I'm going to depict the land, then it should be like an exploration or like uh, a contemplation of what's happening, not just a flat representation of it. Yeah, I love that. And I was speaking of your why, why I know, it, I know it's like so beautiful what you're building and being in the land and having this property, but there must be a part of you that still wants to share this work, right? To communicate something through these beautiful creations. And yeah. why do you think it's important for you to continue making this and sharing it with the world? I mean, the, the things that I build in the land. Oh, and your art. Oh, in the art. Um, Both. First of all, <laughs> I think yeah, it's all yeah. art, but... <laughs> uh, like, what would you, you know, like people who interact with your work to experience or think about? I mean, I think on a good day, if someone's invested and they have the mindfulness to like pause and actually think about work, you know, like I find going to museums like exhausting <laughs> because I'm there and I'm looking at a work and I'm trying to think about like, well, what does this work want? Like, what, what, what does it want me to assume about my interaction with it? And like, what are they doing here and it just becomes like this yeah. conversation that can be really exhausting so if someone's going to have that type of interaction with my work um then i hope that they they get out of it some kind of connection to the complexities pertaining to or surrounding how we experience land and how we use it you know because it's like i get all these other movements that are going on right now they seem really important and they are important and it's like there's so much happening in the world as you know <laughs> like it yes. feels like i don't know i'm 50 and it feels like either a it's because there's so much media or something but like uh, i feel like there's more going on right now than ever before in terms of like crisis and uh you know all these various things um, but we live on earth and like we can, we can have gender equality, but if we don't have land, that's not poisoned, we're going to have a real problem. Yeah. Like we, we have a hard time getting along with each other, whether it be racial or gender or whatever. And all of that, if we solve all that concurrently with thinking about the land, that's great. But I see from my standpoint, obviously, being a landscape artist, the thing that seems like most detrimental to all of us, like that we should all be on the same page about is like the way that we're treating the land and mm. air and everything else. Because it seems like uh, we have a president who just left office who was interested in rolling back a lot of restrictions. I think of America as a place that is like, not maybe number one in terms of standards, but we have some protections. Um, there are lots of places on this planet, lots of places on this planet where you go and it's like not a big deal to be burning whatever and putting it up into the air or burying it, whatever, and just letting it there. And so when I see us in the United States treating the, like you go to the website for Superfund, like that's mm -hmm. those places where the government has to come and clean up because it's so toxic, like no one could possibly, or the company just left, you know, you go to the website for those and it's just like littered across the United States. And so it just feels really dire. 
like really important that we start paying attention to the environment as much as all these other causes that everyone's posting on Instagram and Facebook and stuff like that, because that stuff in the environment hasn't gone away. Like it's been there for quite a while. And it just seems like people are like, (laughs) you know, like it's tired now. Like there are all these new things that are problematic and we're going to pay attention to those. hundred percent. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it's true. It's like the hierarchy of needs, like who, like not who cares. Obviously those other issues are important too, but if we're inside a house that's literally burning down as we're dealing with something in the house, like we got to take care or, or otherwise none of us will be here. And right. Exactly. We have I think like to pass on to our kids. So important. All of the, the issues I, I hear, you know, there's real pain, there's real trauma and there's like real issues there, but it also feels like, you know, maybe it's just too much for people to handle, you know, like it's, it's too much to care about it all the time. But it seems like uh, super, super important because (laughs) I see it around me every day. Like, you know, uh, we live in an area in the river valley where they use sand. They mine sand for fracking. So they, you know, use this sand to extract different things from the earth because it's like helpful in the process. Um, But there's just like waste and mining and like tailings and stuff like that all around. And it's, you know, it's harmful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, How do you so think- that's why that's why I make my work, because I want people to think about like the artificial versus the like romanticized idea of landscape. So in my work, I always put like found styrofoam. I always put open pit mines. So here's this mm-hmm. beautiful landscape that's real seductive and colorful. But then right next to it is like this, you know, big open pit mine. And it's supposed to make this contrast between like our romanticized vision of like, oh, we have national parks and we have this countryside. But then also like even just to have your cell phone or whatever to have your house, all of these raw materials come from somewhere. And it's a matter of like, how are we extracting them and how are we obtaining them? Uh, That's important because there are harmful ways of doing it. And then there are less harmful ways of doing it. So I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, I was recently, I visited our local museum. I'm in Delaware at the Delaware Art Museum. And I was reading a little bit about the pre-Raphaelite movement and how they were encouraged to capture what they saw, like including the pollution they were dealing with, the industrial revolution and how not to, you know, just romanticize the the beauty that's obviously still there. And I think it's beautiful that you bring those, you know, sometimes even when we think about those things are ugly, but you bring them in in a beautiful way that like both educates us and visually your work is so stunning. So you really have mastered that. How do you feel that artists or creatives or art lovers, how can we honor our planet more, you know, without like maybe someone's not like a, super activist person in the environment yeah. realm, but what, what can we do as individuals? Because I know there's a lot of power in those micro shifts and micro things that yes. we can contribute. Yeah. I mean, I had a friend once who suggested that if everyone on this planet simply put a lid on their pot while they were boiling water, that we could, you know, save X number of, you know, cubic, whatever <laughs> in energy terms. Um, And so little things like that, there are all sorts of websites that offer like 10 tips that can reduce your footprint and things like that. Then they're pretty simple, like, you know, putting a lid on your water, um, putting, you know, plastic over your windows so you don't spend as much on heating. And most of these things are beneficial to the people who do them. Like you don't have to wait as long to boil your (laughs) pasta. Like most of these things are beneficial. It's just a matter of like whether or not we think about them, you know, like um, I know for myself. I frequently become upset about like, you know, I'm letting the water run to get it warm. Mm -hmm. There are things that I wish were available, you know, like a, a maybe like per faucet heater that when I call for water, I wait a little bit and then the water comes out the perfect temperature instead of wasting all that water. There are so many little things like that, that I think that we could do, but I think ultimately the number one thing we can do is think about what we're buying. You know, you vote with your checkbook, you vote with your credit card, you vote with whatever in terms of like, I'm going to buy this product over that product because I like the way that they're dealing with things responsibly. Mm. It seems like we live in a culture, obviously, where we want what's cheapest. 
-hmm. and we want the most of it for the cheapest amount. But you have to, I think, consider, um, for instance, you know, these companies that give you soda. You go to buy a Coke and then they give you the plastic bottle. They don't feel responsible for what you do with that plastic bottle afterwards. And that's why we see them everywhere. They're ubiquitous in the landscape. Like you're in Big Sur and you're off the like highway and you go for a mile hike and you think like, wow, maybe I'm the only person who's ever been here. And then you look down <laughs> and you see like nope. a Coke bottle and you're like, nope. <laughs> so <laughs> Oh, I think some awful. of these things is just like buying the stuff that the companies actually care about. You might have to pay a couple cents more for it, but then you're helping out in the long run. hundred percent. I love that. Yeah. There's definitely a cost to all the cheapness. And when people complain about these big companies, but they support them every day, that's when I start to, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, <laughs> well, you show you know me what? with how you're spending your money. <laughs> then right. then and you, you know what I think it is, is that just everything about our culture is about making it easy. Mm -hmm. And when it is so easy to like stream music instead of buying it or like, you know, supporting musicians, things like that, when it becomes so easy, it's like, uh, you know, it's like hard not to do that. And yeah. they know that. And that's where the, you know, the economy of scale comes in because if we get enough people to do this, then it'll just become the new norm. 100%. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, I'm going to ask you some questions about because I know our listeners want to know this about you. And um, I, I think I originally saw your work on the album cover. <laughs> so I really I do want to talk about your career and how you um, started to share your work. And I know, obviously, like, there's that part of us that wants to be in the studio and create and think about these things. But then there's a part of us, like I mentioned earlier, that wants to share and put yourself out there. Can you talk a little bit about what, how did you start putting yourself out there in the world and connecting with people? Cause I know a lot of our listeners are also artists and I always love to bring in, you know, people like mm -hmm. you who have an amazing career with any tips of like, how did you start to get some visibility for your work? What was the, that process like? Yeah. So much of the, like the way in which I became, you know, uh, let's say just beyond my county, you know, mm -hmm. like became a, a name that people knew about um, was through the early days of blogs. I you love know, like blogs. <laughs> back in the day, there used to be these blogs in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And um, you could, you know, get your work submitted to it and get featured on there. And then all of a sudden you had a following and they join your email list. Like, remember <laughs> those days Yeah, like where you had to like have a client for your email. Um, <laughs> and it used to be, you could just email people now, like Google's like, you have more than 10 people on your list. Like you're closed down. Yes. Yeah. So I think I used to submit work to uh, small galleries that I thought had an interesting uh, collection of artists that they were showing. I remember one uh, space was uh, Fecal Face was out in San Francisco and they had a really big following and I got a show through Receiver Gallery, which was like a little art space and uh, in San Francisco. And it's kind of like once you got a show in a space, then other people were aware of your work. So, so much of it was about these young places taking a chance on you and not necessarily, you know, knowing that they're going to pay the rent with your work, but they felt strongly about it. Um, so, yeah, I remember there were quite a few galleries that were showing work uh, it was considered like street art i guess you know back then which i don't think they just had a name for stuff where it was like people were doing all sorts of graphic design based like loose kind of work um but then um i think after that obviously doing the album cover for boni Vare didn't hurt you know, you like know that was... that's such a beautiful cover yeah, but in the in the beginning, it was just a lot of work of like submitting things to this is colossal and boing boing and like you yeah. know all these different places, just constantly submitting Shout your to work Chris. to them and just saying like, hey, this is what I'm doing. If you think it's cool, I'm like post it, <laughs> you know, like yes. 
uh, it's worth so a shot. Power in that. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And that's why I started create. Cause I, that's when I start, I graduated, it was like 2011 and the blogs were still very strong. And I was like, well, you know what? I love discovering art on yes. blogs. Like, so I started one too. And I still love it. <laughs> I'm actually thinking of creating a personal blog because I'm so over the five second like attention span of Instagram. Yes. Like I wa- mm-hmm. I crave those days where I would like scroll through every day. You'd things. go to a website and like <laughs> yes. check it before you know you woke up. Yeah, exactly. Like that. what's new? I remember there was a blog called "My Love for You Is a Stampede of Wild Horses." <laughs> I don't think I see that one. That that was, I mean, yeah, but I mean, you know, and what happens is a lot of times a a blog will just regurgitate what other blogs have posted and so on. Um, But there were some that were out there that were like kind of specific, you know, maybe nature based or something like that. And then you'd go, you'd have them bookmarked and you'd go to those sites and just see what five posts have happened in the last like three days. And that was a great time because you learned so much that way. No ads, you know, like no bullshit. It's just like you (laughs) learned so much about what, what these people, these gatekeepers, I guess, were like considering interesting and I, you know, I didn't mind that they were out there doing the work for me because I found a lot of that stuff interesting myself. But yeah, blogs in the early day, that that was where it was at. And like now, if you asked me, like other than like the main ones that everyone knows about, like Juxtapose and High Fructose and like, you know, places like that, like what what's out there that is a daily thing where people are posting interviews and stuff. And, you know, that's why I submitted to your magazine. Cause I saw it and I was like, this is like the old days. This is cool. <laughs> I lo- oh, Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I, I like want to keep that. Cause I, I see where the world is going. And I don't like it. I, I create, like, I still listen to like the radio. <laughs> Um, we went camping with my boyfriend and we literally, we, there was no Wi-Fi, and we listened to the radio every night, like instead of watching TV and it was the coolest thing. I'm like, I love this shit. Like this is the, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I could do that if there weren't advertisements because yes, I, I, I know. cannot stand advertisements, but that's how they, obviously the, how they pay I for know. it. But maybe if you got it like a college station. Yeah, <laughs> it was, um, this is a side note, but yeah, it was one of those local stations and they, it was kind of like NPR where they were doing like their membership drive. And I still mm-hmm. have, it was a holiday reef drive. It was like, <laughs> who makes the holiday <laughs> reef drive? But it was, it was so fun. But yeah, I agree. I think there's, I, that's why, you know, it's, it's tough. It's kind of like running a blog or running an online magazine. And it's kind of like being an artist too. It's the same struggles, like just staying alive in the, in this really high, Taste, you know, ever changing thing, but I think there's so much value to that. So I hope that whoever has a blog listening, please don't stop. Yeah, <laughs> I like and, going and, on blogs. And send them to me so I <laughs> so I can follow them so I know what the heck is going 100%, on. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, thank you so much. And what do you have going on right now? This has been such a beautiful conversation, and I'm so excited to be getting to know you. What are you working on now, other than your amazing landscaping projects that I yeah. was looking at your Instagram? A um, lot of landscaping, a lot of hard work, like physical labor, which is exhausting. But um, I've been doing cyanotypes. So what I do is I take photographs and then put them into Photoshop and make these kind of like collages that are seamless. It's called Skyland Sky, where it's just like an endless horizon line, then sky and then upside down horizon and like sky and so on. And then I take those things and output them to film and make cyanotypes out of them and then work on top of them. Um, I just love the blue of cyanotype and then like mixing the colors with them and stuff like that. So that photographic process has been something that I've been kind of working on perfecting and then continue to do sculptures. Uh, I'm kind of all over the board. And when it comes to work similar to my landscape projects, I like to have like five or six things going at once. So if I wake up one morning and I'm like, I don't really feel like doing a cyanotype today. I feel like doing the sculpture, you know, and then I can go out and just collect stuff from the land and start converting it into diorama materials. Um, Yeah. So uh, there's a show that the jealous curator uh, curated and that's, what what is that? Uh, it's on right now. It's in Minneapolis. It's at the Sioux Center for Visual Arts. And so I have a nice sculpture in that space. And then I have another opening happening uh, this Saturday, showing some of the Skyland Sky prints 
uh, at the local gallery in Minneapolis called Gallery 360. So I'm continuing to make these uh, works in between raising kids and <laughs> doing landscape projects and, you know, the weird weather that's happening in the world right now. 100%. Well, congratulations. And please keep making your awesome work. It's so beautiful. And it's it's like a restful experience when when looking at it, even I love when your reels pop up on our feed too. It's just, it's stunning. Thank you so much well, for sharing. Thank you your very story. much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And I can't wait to see what you create next. And thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me in your latest edition. Thank you.